I got a brand new invention. Muller Rice has a corner pot creation. On the side, there's fruit that's yummy. Remix and please your tummy. In popular culture, advertising is sometimes seen as the sexy career full of handsome, clean-shaven men in suits sitting around board tables and perpetually sexually harass women wearing tight dresses. This is largely thanks to the AMC series Mad Men, which romanticised the profession through the cunning use of John Hamm. Mad Men was inspired by the memoirs of proto-ad man Jerry Della Femina. Today, human resources, are you kidding? Would they stop it or would I be arrested? <laughs> Published in 1971, his book titled From Those Wonderful Folks Who Brought You Pearl Harbor was named after a joke suggestion for a Panasonic slogan Femina once made during a meeting. In the book, Femina tells a series of anecdotes about his time in advertising, who he worked for, the competitors, the clients and the work, creating a colourful picture of the advertising world in the late 1950s and throughout the 60s. After the success of Mad Men, Femina was quick to comment that their depiction wasn't totally on point. We made Mad Men look like Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. We were much wilder, we drank more, we carried on more. So why does any of this matter? It doesn't. My point is that the story behind advertising, whether true, fictionalised or romanticised, is always way more interesting than the end product. But one thing I'm not, darling, is insane. I'm 100% normal. Relatively speaking, Femina's world in the 50s and 60s had less product competition and significantly less platforms to worry about. You ran print ads in magazines or on billboards, you recorded ads for radio or you filmed ads for television. Early advertisements were simplistic, pushing virtues or paying celebrities, sometimes medical professionals, to endorse products. According to this repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. With the rise of individualism in the mid to late 20th century, advertisers began to focus more on the aspirational qualities of products or services. Owning a certain car or using a certain cosmetic said something about you as a person. The overall quality of the thing you were advertising began to matter less. Fire plum. So smooth. Fire cherry. So nice. Fast forward to today and thanks to our collective diminished attention span, the internet, social media and increased competition, we're now seeing some of the most insipid ads ever broadcast. In many examples, making ads that are ostensibly a relevant wank that have nothing to do with the product but have the potential to be widely shared or go viral is now the goal. Case in point, animal adverts. Animals have been used as mascots for years. The Andrix puppy may be the most notable example, having persisted for over 40 years. A cute addition to an otherwise generic toilet paper advert, the Andrix puppy was first used to replace a young girl in an ad block by censors, when it was thought a child trailing toilet paper around their house would encourage wastefulness. Just about everyone likes Andrix because, well, it's so nice and soft. The Andrix puppy makes some sense to me. You both shit and keep a pet in your home, though hopefully the two things don't intersect as much as the ads suggest. Tony the Tiger is another long-standing animal mascot, albeit a maligned one. A famously despised ad from my childhood involved a Bart Simpson surrogate singing a catchy but agonising song about the great taste of frosted flakes, in which Tony held some kind of dystopian serial appreciation rally with thousands of impressionable young children. Tony was recently revived in 2015 with the fucking awful Tony is back campaign featuring an ad where what appears to be a sleep-deprived drug addict eats a hearty breakfast of Frosted Flakes and then proceeds to successfully suicide bomb a cafe full of innocent people. They're great! It's all yours, Tiger! And you! I guess this is the modern, edgy interpretation of Tony the Tiger we all wanted. I don't care, Tony. It's such a stupid job anyway. And Monkey was first used to advertise ITV Digital, a now defunct TV service the likes of NTL or Sky, and became an immensely popular character in the late 90s and early 2000s. A puppet designed by the Jim Henson Company, he played straight man to drunken legend Johnny Vegas's Northern Moron, a character I'm sure took a lot of research and preparation on his part. <laughs> After ITV Digital tanked, Monkey was revived to promote PG Tips. He is perhaps the first and only animal mascot used to shell multiple products, being so popular that he had almost completely eclipsed the product he was created to sell in the first place. A more modern equivalent of Monkey is probably compare the Meerkat's Alexander Orlov. There we compare Meerkat. Orlov is another character with an obvious contextual basis. Market and Meerkat sound alike. His exasperation at the confusion between his website and Compare the Markets had genuine comedy appeal. An appeal that was slowly worn down with repetition and a Flintstones-esque desperation to create variety through additional characters and celebrity cameos. Can I help you? It's me. 
Macaulay. The ongoing Compare the Meerkat campaign has now transformed into another ridiculous ad series almost divorced from the original concept and product thanks in part to the popularity of their mascot. Get out. Get out! Something that their competitors are now desperate to emulate. Hit it! The popularity of Compare the Meerkat has given rise to a number of incredibly lazy campaigns. The Miller Rice Bear, the Fox's Panda, the Cephalogy Sloth, the Bird's Eye Polar Bear. Most are without context and all failed to catch on in quite the same way Orlov did. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> this concept of animals selling products was broken down into its simplest form by the McVitie's 12 million pound sweet campaign, which saw a bunch of ads featuring tiny cute CG animals emerge from various McVitie's biscuit packets. In a post on the United Biscuits website, Martin Glenn, the CEO, was quoted as saying, Our master brand campaign aimed to get to the heart of the emotional role biscuits play in our lives. Leaving aside how gay this guy is for biscuits, I'm sure the agency creators brainstorming your campaign had that in mind when they agreed on, why don't we just do, hey, look at the cute puppy, also digestives? All we have to do is find a compelling truth in each product. Okay. How about this? Try this shampoo, it's fantastic. My problem with more recent animal adverts is that they're less about creating a memorable mascot or character with an animal as a basis, and more about putting your product next to a cute or funny thing and hoping consumers will be confused or hypnotised into sharing your ads and buying your product. It's a cynical attempt to appeal to younger people through the medium of kittens, puppies and dancing bears. An ad no better than a YouTube video of your dog, the Andrix puppy without necessary context. There's an art to visual communication. Ads we grew up watching can be as nostalgic or memorable to us as the films we saw and the music we listened to. Animal ads have become the lowest common denominator of product promotion. At worst, an attempt by lazy idiots to juxtapose something pre-existing and memorable with the consumer product. At best, the creation of a character more memorable than the product they were originally supposed to sell. Stop making them. Okay.